All right. Um, yeah. Thanks a lot um, for the introduction. I can assure you that I'm also very happy to be back in Barcelona. It's been some time since I've been here. I don't tell you which year I was last here. It's some time ago, and it's always great to be back to the sunshine coming from a country where it's still very cold and cloudy and sometimes rainy. Um, I'm very happy to present uh, the results of a legal study today, although I have to admit I didn't do most of the work, but most of the work was done by Niels Dietrich, who is also present here, but I'm happy to present the results of this study. As Pedro mentioned, we already uh, conducted in the previous phase of the project a legal study on copyright and database protection. And um, this part of the project now was um, um, related to privacy or and data protection. So these are the main legal issues concerning um, dealing with research data. Um, things are changing very fast and uh, we finished the last study on copyright last year. Um, this year in January the Com European Commission introduced a proposal or it's, it's still a communication on also new schemes of protection of non-personal data. So it's possible that within the course of this year there will be uh, at least a big discussion on a data producers' right, even on about data which are not personal data. So, um, of course, this will also have a big effect on, on the research field, although, of course, the Commission is also thinking of making an exception for research field in, in this new scheme. But this is still a development discussion, so we will see in the course of the year how things will turn out on this issue. But my is issue today is data protection, and, of course, uh, lawyers don't even, or Many uh, very often don't have a good reputation for different reasons. One reason is that you make nice projects and do a lot of nice things and then in the end it turns out this is not possible and that is not possible because of legal restrictions. And um, I'm a bit in the same role today. Uh, talking about data protection is, is very difficult these days because we have in Europe very strict rules on data protection. The problem with these strict rules is that they are strict but it's very difficult to implement them. And that's the basic problem we have with data protection law. We have a nice theoretical uh, building of data protection, but when it comes to implementing it in practice, it gets very difficult. So um, if you um, would exaggerate a bit, you could say it's a uh, dead law, more or less, because it's very difficult to really implement data protection as it should be. But nevertheless, uh, we have to look at what the law is and what possibilities we have to cope with this problem. And the concept of our, of our study was to look into uh, data protection rules uh, to, uh, to the extent uh, they put a framework on um, processing data within uh, research fields, especially within the open research data pilot. And the second part of the study was related to the PSI rules, um, public sector information, which is a different scheme. PSI is meant to provide access to data which is stored in public, uh, um, public institutions. But I will focus today, because of lack of time, on the, on the first part, on the data protection rules. And uh, the study was conducted from January 2015 to December 2016. And the idea was to analyze data protection barriers to sharing in the context spe specifically of the open research data pilot. Um, the legal methodology is in, uh, basically quite simple. We look at the legal framework and try to find out applying, applying this legal framework to the subject at hand, which is in this case the open research data pilot, and find out which barriers exist and how we could alleviate these impediments to sharing of data in this context. So, uh, within uh, Horizon 2020, the Commission is running Open Research Data Pilot. As you might know, the pilot is aiming at pr improving and maximizing access and reuse of research data. And as we heard already in the morning, it uh, try, it's, will be becoming a, a steady institution, even a legal entity. So. Uh, the idea, of course, is to really uh, have a central institution for exchange and sharing of research data. 
Um, the projects taking part in the pilot are obliged to uh, e uh, first deposit the research data in a data in research data repository, and to take measures to enable third parties to access, mine, exploit, reproduce, and disseminate the research data. This means basically it's a use about open access. If we look at data protection framework, there, um, there are some rules in place already for a long time. Uh, the data protection discussion started in the 60s of the, uh, the 20th century. And uh, a very basic um, foundation of data protection is the European Charter of Fundamental Rights, which guarantees the protection of personal data, Article 8 of this charter says everyone has the right to protection of personal data concerning him. In Europe, we have this concept of personal data, which is a bit different from this privacy concept we have in the US and other parts of the world. Privacy is more about protecting our personal sphere against intrusion, um, whereas um, the European um, concept is more directed as having a right of self-determination on your personal data. And by this way, protecting your privacy. So this is the first problem already we have in data protection that we have a bit different concepts in different parts of the world. And of course, data flows are global. So um, already there's, there's some clash between different concepts of data protection if you look at it on a global perspective. Um, we have a dire European directive from 1995 which harmonized data protection legislation in the member states. Um, the effect of harmonization is always um, difficult to assess. For example, we made a study a couple of years ago that even basic definitions in data protection vary from member state to member state. So uh, having a directive doesn't mean we have completely harmonized law, but still we have some leeways for national legislators to to make their own rules uh, within this framework. Um, we have now the situation that um, since uh, May 2016, we have a general data protection regulation, which will enter into force in 2018, which is next year. And the difference between a directive and regulation is that the regulation is is in, uh, enforced directly, so it doesn't have to be implemented by the member states, but takes force directly. And the idea, of course, of the Commission behind this was to, uh, to create a higher level of harmonization of data protection rules within Europe. Um, but um, having a regulation doesn't mean that the national legislator doesn't have to do anything anymore, but also the national legislator now can make implementing legislation to implement this regulation. And we can already see from the developments recently that the effect of this regulation may be the contrary, which means that we will even have more dispersed situation within Europe. Why? Because, of course, the national legislators try to, again, uh, find their own ways within the framework set by the regulation. We have in, in Germany now, in the, we're in the process of making implementing legislation, and the third draft is already out and is very heavily criticized even by data protection specialists for going too far in implementing national policies against the regulation. So it's far from sure that we will have more harmonization by this regulation as was the goal of the European legislator by implementing this regulation. Looking at data protection rules, of course, the first question is uh, when, uh, which is the scope of applic uh, application Basically, um, data protection law applies to data which concern um, some kind of personal relationship or re relation to a person. Talking about data, of course, the difference between data and information is that data is the state of information in storage and transport. So basically, we're talking about information. And to identify if data protection laws apply, we have to look, does the information contain any information that can be related to a person? And this is the first big problem already we have in data protection because there are different theories how far or how narrow we have to construe this personal relationship. Basically, 
most of the information we have can somehow be related to a person. For example, that you are sitting here, I see your face, you are sitting here, it's personal information, no? that you as a person are sitting here. Or we had, with, with Google, we had a problem that Google was um, uh, taking pictures of houses no? with the street and the number of the house. Is it personal information? It could be, because of course, it, people are living in the house and the, the, the street number in the house can be used to identify the person. So, this is already disputed in data protection law, how narrow or how broad does this personal relationship have to be construed. Um, the definition would be any information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person, it's the data subject, and of course, as I mentioned, the key element is the possible identification of a person. Some examples I put here, name, address, images, voice recordings, and of course, we again distinguish in data protection law between personal information and sensitive information. Sensitive information is specially protected. Um, information about um, um, health, about biological traits, about sex and so on, sex life and so on, are very sensitive and are, uh, enjoy special protection in data protection law. Um, within uh, coming to the pilot, research data shall be made openly available and reusable and uh, of course the question is what is research data? The commission defines research data as information, in particular facts or numbers collected to be examined and considered as a basis for reasoning, discussion or calculation. And examples of research data, as you all know, include statistics, experiments, measurements, observations in field work, survey results, interview recordings, and so on. And you can imagine already from this definition, which is very broad, that many of the data concerned in the research field are personal data. Uh, starting with uh, data about health in, in the health sector, which uh, are even sensitive data, but up to measurement of field work where researchers go out in the field, and of course also the the, the fact that somebody um, measures something in the field at a certain time in a certain location is personal data. It's also personal data that uh, is where the data protection laws apply. So um, the problem we have here, as you can see, is not only that, it's, uh, that there are different legal theories on how to broad or how to narrow to construe this, but also to find out in a specific case if there are personal data present or not. So you cannot make a general rule to say this is personal data or that is personal data, but you always have to look at the specific case to determine if personal data is present or not. And this makes it a bit difficult to make a general uh, statements about uh, the application of data protection law even in the research field. So we have to evaluate this on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and uh, especially, we're especially close to data protection rules, of course, when uh, in any way natural persons are involved, either in doing the research or as an object of this research that we're talking about. I mentioned some fields here, medicine, bi biotechnology, social sciences, where uh, very often um, this research contains information that can be traced to individuals and hence qualify as personal data. So if we uh, start from the outset that personal data are present, then the next step is what does it mean for using the data, for exchanging the data? And the basic rule, of course, is data, data protection law, data protection rules, restrict the possibilities of processing personal data. In data protection, we have the rule that processing is generally forbidden, prohibited, and only permitted in specific cases. One case is that there's a statutory permission. So the legislator says, in these cases, it is permitted to process the data. For example, in employment relationship hmm, to, or in any contract, contractual relationship, you have to process data to, to implement the con contract. So in this case, it's permitted. The second pillar is consent. And consent means the data subject whose data are processed has to agree that the data processing takes place. And this is, in uh, talking about the internet or connected environments, this is the main um, basis for 
permitting data processing to have consent. Of course, there are certain preconditions to consent, but they are very difficult to fulfill, and I will try to explain why it's the, the case. Processing is very broad, so in, in the, the citation from the General Data Protection Regulation, which will enter into force next year, any operation or set of operations which is performed upon personal data or sets of personal data. Collection, recording, organization, structuring, storing, and so on, dissemination, transmission, and so on. So it's a very broad concept uh, to which data protection rules apply. Any, any operation in connection with personal data. Within the pilot, uh, the research data should be deposited in a research data repository, and which means the data must be uploaded into an online research data archive, and the third parties shall be able to access and reuse this research data. And of course, all these um, steps are involving some kind of processing to which data protection laws would apply. Uploading as well as reuse of data and processing. The basic rule is, as I mentioned, that uh, there has to be a permission and um, coming to this permission, especially to the requirements as to consent, which I mentioned, one of the main restrictions is the purpose limitation, which means data have to be collected to, um, according to a, specif a specified legitimate purpose and they can only be processed within this purpose they have been collected for. The same is true for consent. If I consent to processing of my personal data, it has to be within a specified purpose to which I consent. If I change the purpose later, I need a new consent. And this purpose limitation is one of the big restrictions we have in data protection and is one of the biggest problems we have in the research field because, of course, you're collecting data and you don't know what you need the data for in 10 years or in five years. And so the purpose may change very quickly and data protection law would tell us you need a new consent or a new permission you know, if you change the purpose. And that will be very difficult in practice, of course, to first to find out you know, if the purpose has changed and then to get a new consent. So taking data protection rules strictly uh, already faces the big, first big challenge with this purpose limitation. Um, this, and this is not changing with the new da uh, general data uh, protection regulation, which also has this principle of purpose limitation. Second principle applying here is data minimization. It's also the... <laughs> the concept of data protection law to have as little processing as possible to reduce the risks to, to your, to your um, information self-determination. This is also a concept from the 70s, no? where you had mainframe computers and somebody was responsible for this mainframe computer and processing the data. And today you have network environments and this principle of minimization doesn't work in this environment anymore. It's, not, it's very difficult to, to implement it, but still we have this as a basic principle of data protection law, which means processing should be limited to the minimum amount necessary. necessary. And um, also means that personal data should only be processed if the purpose of the processing could not reasonably be fulfilled by other means. If you will look at the pilot from this perspective, um, the pilot should enable third parties to access and reuse the data without any restriction, and the data shall be available within the time limit and usable beyond the original purpose for which the data were collected. And you can see already the conflict that comes out of um, this aim of the data pilot if you look at it at the background of these two principles I mentioned. So there, the, the result of the basic result, which is also the result of our study, is basically um, what the data pilot is aiming at is clearly at odds with the, with the basics of data protection law, which means um, mostly purpose limitation and data minimization. And the conclusion would be personal data cannot be made available on an open access basis as is required in the open research pilot. This is a bit shocking, of course, <laughs> result also within the project. And um, as a lawyer, you always try to look at it, okay, what can we do about this situation? How can we make it possible to achieve what we want to do? And of course, 
uh, there are always ways, lawyers always find ways uh, uh, as far as possible to, to make things possible. Um, so we can also look at some exceptions that may apply to the research field in data protection law. For example, in the general data, uh, general data protection regulation, we have a specific exception for processing and storage of personal data for scientific purposes. The problem with this exemption is uh, that uh, the intended use has to be bound on a specific purpose again of research and there have to be appropriate safeguards in particular to ensure respect for the principle of data minimization. So the principles don't go away but they still stay even in this new regulation and again we have to align this, even this exemption for scientific purposes to uh, specific purpose, which is the basic problem. There were some, um, some attempts in the legislative process to make a broader exception in the scientific field for, to make possible big data, but uh, in the end there was a compromise which again restricted the use of personal data even in, for big data applications. So, um, if we look at the pilot, of course, the deposition of the research data in open access repository is con not connected to a specific purpose of research and not even to research purposes at all. And again, we have the situation that what the pilot is doing is at odds with data protection framework. Um, data are made available for any purposes, scientific or not. Appropriate safeguards to ensure are not in place. So open access use of personal data and thus the participation in the pilot cannot be legitimized with the research exemptions. So with the research exemptions that specifically are provided for in the um, data protection rules, we cannot really justify an open access principle for the repository. So we look at the second pillar, maybe consent is working. And consent, as I mentioned, in network environments is the basic um, uh, instrument to enable data processing. Um, um, consent means that the data subject um, must be, must give his consent under certain conditions, must be freely given, it must be specific, informed and unambiguous. Um, again, we have here specific, which means also related to a certain purpose. You have to know about this purpose before you consent and your consent has to be freely given, which means um, you must have some kind of choice to give the consent. And this specifically, this freely given is the biggest problem today on the internet but because usually a service provider says, we advise you about what we're doing with your data, but if you don't consent, we don't provide you the service. Hmm? Is this freely given consent or not? This is one of the big problems we have in a legal discussion also. Um, basically, there are some areas, for example, employment relationship, where we say this is not freely given consent because there's an imbalance between the parties. But in, in a normal service, internet service, the legal doctrine is still that this is free, freely given consent, although maybe I don't have an alternative. And there's also some um, attempts to change this, to um, put the focus more on um, consent and the alternatives I have. If I have some other service providers and still stick with this provider, then consent is freely given. But it's still not very clear where to draw the line this, in this case. So consent also has some requirements. And uh, as I mentioned already, it also requires a clear and concise definition of the purpose. And again, we have the purpose, no? which is the main problem in also with the data pilot. Um, so also consent as a um, permission to data processing is related to a specific purpose of processing that has to be um, um, the basis for consent and has to be also informed, the data subject has to be informed about this. Looking at the research pilot again, the purposes of the further use of the data and the recipient, recipients are unclear. Um, basically, uh, any uses, not just specific ones, uh, should be possible in the future for the data deposit in the repository. 
and also the data will be transferred to all third parties receiving them. And under these circumstances, at least in our view, it's also not possible to fulfill the requirements of specific and informed consent, which means open access use of personal data and the participation in the pilot cannot be legitimized by consent. So, what other solutions do we have to dissolve this conflict uh, we have here? And of course, the um, big um, exit for the problem seems to be anonymization. Anonymization means that uh, the relation of the information to a person will be erased and this means we don't have personal data anymore and this means data protection law don't apply anymore. So the result of anonymization could be that we fall out of the scope of data protection laws and then we can do with the data whatever we want. But, and now again the but, as a lawyer I have to say but, <laughs> Um, the problem with anonymization is how effective is it? And if you talk to informatic people, they will tell you it doesn't work, it's not possible. You just need three features of information to, to re-align uh, re information to a person. So um, again, there's a big uncertainty here in this anonymization. It seems to be the big way out of all the problems, but if you look at Closer, closer it's not, because um, then again the question is, from a legal perspective, uh, do we acknowledge the current ways of anonymization as being sufficient to get us out of a data protection law, or do we say it's so risky uh, to, anonymization is not so efficient uh, not to exclude any personal relationship for the future? So this is also a bit gray area still in data protection law. Is the, uh, is, isn't, isn't it possible later to re-identify the person again? And then uh, we're back into uh, data protection law. So um, again, of course, this has to be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. And certain factors have to be um, acknowledged in this evaluation. For example, um, what data is freely available in public registers, what information is held by other institutions, how can we combine this data, at what costs, um, and so on. But again, it's a big uncertainty as far as anonymization is concerned. So to sum up, um, basically the pilot aims at making research data generated by projects freely available and reusable on an open access basis. Um, if such research data include personal data, data protection rules are applicable. The use of personal data within the pilot is at odds with leading data protection principles, and the open access use of personal data cannot be legitimized by research exception or consent of the data subject. Data protection risk can be excluded by effective anonymization of the data. Um, but also this anonymization, as I mentioned, uh, is not uh, still clear if it's really the big way out of all the problems. Looking into the future, um, we uh, uh, have to first uh, take into account this regulation I mentioned already, which takes, uh, gets, takes force in May 2018. But uh, this regulation will not change the basic principles I mentioned, so these will still be in place. In my view, this regulation is already outdated before it comes into force, because it doesn't doesn't take any account of the realities of network environment. But it's still um, uh, more or less based on the model of big frame, uh, mainframe computers where we have a data processor that has control over all the activities. The second problem we have with this regulation is that um, it took a long time and a big effort to establish this regulation. And if you talk to people from the commission, they say, we won't touch upon this topic for a very long time because this is politically hot topic. So this means also that it will be very difficult to change data protection rules on a statutory level. It has to be done in Brussels, and Brussels doesn't want to touch upon it anymore. So as the technical environment, business models and so on are changing all the time, it is very difficult to adapt the law to this. So what we could look at is to look at the level below 
the statutory level, to look at self-regulation mechanisms, to look at standard contract terms. That could be ways to alleviate the problem a bit. For example, um, there's also this now the so-called Article 29 group of data protection commissioners who do some kind of interpretation of the law, which is uh, very influential in, in practice. And this could be soft ways to a bit um, um, shift, shift things in favor of more freedom for research processing of data, either through making a, a favorable interpretation of the law or through standard term contracts. The other option we could look for is um, if we have this big problem with the purpose limitation, um, one alternative would be not to make open access but to control who is putting which data on the repository, to have some kind of co control procedure inserted in between. That could be a safe, legally safe way to get out of the problems. The other option is to say, okay, we have a conflict. Uh, we have to see how things work out in practice and if there will be any problems. That's what the big uh, internet companies are doing. No? They just do things they, the way they want. And then if there, some problems comes up, they try to negotiate with authorities to find some national solutions and so on. And it's working quite fine for them. No? They are big, of course, they are big global companies um, which don't have to be afraid even of national legislators no? because they're so big that they make their own laws. Uh, I think um, open, open air is not as big yet <laughs> to be so powerful to make their own rules. So uh, still there have to be ways uh, to be found to, to get out of this concept. This is conflict, sorry. Um, we, one uh, one uh, idea would also be, if you look at the future, to alleviate a bit the requirements for consent, uh, to lower it, for example, allow for general consent for the data subject to all kinds of research-related purposes. If this will hold in front of courts, we have to see if it's still specific enough from the data protection perspective. We could also look at uh, extending research privileges to allow broader use of personal data, at least for research purposes. But again, in the end, this would have to be done by the legislator. And I mentioned already the problems we have with legislation on this, on this uh, field, especially on the European law level. Um, of course, we can always make, as a sci uh, scientists, we can always make recommendations to the legislator, and one recommendation coming from our project would also be to, uh, to the legislator to um, make a bit more, create a bit more leeway for um, uh, processing data in research context. But I mentioned already the problems that are involved with this. Thank you for the attention so far. And of course, I'm happy to take any questions and uh, participate in the discussion. Thank you very much. We have time for only one question, okay, because we will have the panel discussion after these first two sessions, but we can have time for one question. Thank you. I try to make it short. It's usually impossible. But um, I'm Leif Larsson, and I'm from the IT Center of Science in Finland. I mostly work in the RDA context. I have a couple of quick comments, I think. One of the major problems we are facing today is that uh, we don't really know who knows the data. If we think of the data the authorities, the hospital is collecting, is it our data or is it the hospital's data or is yeah. it somebody else's? Yeah. And that introduces quite a lot of yeah. uh, uh, problems and this goes to the my data, for example, which is uh, a small effort, but anyway. Uh, the other thing is also that the politicians don't understand really that the anonymization of things is not going to work yeah. because combining data and doing mass massively search among different databases will reveal any way yeah. all the details and that we see from the Google already. They know much more of our diseases or whatever we are suffering from. And uh, so we are trying to protect something which Google already knows. Yeah. Yeah, I completely agree with you. <laughs> um, uh, we have here basic conflict that's not only working for the research field, but in general. The data protection laws are too strict to be working in practice. And that's, 
something has to be done about this. There's, there's a, of course, a policy discussion, but as I mentioned, the, the rules are now fixed for many years, at, at least in Europe. The first question you mentioned is very interesting. Who owns the data? And this is not a question of data protection law, but it's a question of, of yeah, property law. We have, a, we have now a big discussion for two years should we uh, uh, establish some kind of ownership for data in general, which will also include personal data? And uh, as I mentioned this in the beginning, uh, this discussion will unfold during this year and will be very interesting to see what the Commission gets out of it. I would suggest that as far as it looks now, I'm a bit involved in this also, as far as it looks now, we, we will not have a property right on data in general. What we might get is something like access rights to data, which means uh, the, the situation now is that many data are held by private companies and in fact they are kept as property, although it's not property in a legal sense, they're kept under control of big companies, Google, Facebook and so on. And the idea now is to create more freedom of or more free flow of, inf uh, of information and data by creating access rights for certain classes of data. For example, data or information which is necessary for big data applications. So you might, what you might get is a right of institutions to get access to certain kind of data held by big companies, which is a very interesting concept. And we will, we will have big conflicts about this, I'm sure about it, because the big players will defend themselves against on, on different levels. But this is a very interesting discussion. So this, this discussion, who owns data, is going on. To my, 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 I have a very clear position on this. It's not possible to own data, because data is basically information in this, in this uh, stage of storage and transport. If I protect data or if I create property right in data, I create a property right in information. And information is essential for all communication and for all life in society and you cannot create property rights in information. That's my position. But we will see how, how it turns out on a European level. Okay, thank you. Uh, do not forget your questions because we have the panel discussion so we have time. Let's move to the second presentation.